welcome back to another episode of Dungeon Hammer, brought to you by One Mind Syndicate. I am your host, Gersh One, and I'm here with my two co-hosts, Docile Creature, and the Sound Alchemist. And today we're going to be teaching you guys how to create your very own D&D character. But before we get into that, I wanted to let you guys know that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrials.com slash syndicate and browse the unmatched selections of audio programs. Download a title for free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrials.com slash syndicate. Link in the description. Now there's a lot that goes into the formation of basically an alter you. Um, you are going to be role-playing this character and by doing that, you not only have to choose what's in the book, which is your class and your race, but you also have to choose a character backstory. So wh what process do you guys go through in order to create uh, a, basically a, a, a another person? I guess this, we should also say that not we're not trying to play ourselves. We're going to if we're trying to break away from that, it's going to be an alternate you. Because even though you're not playing yourself, so you're not playing docile creature, you are playing Boagrius, and at this point, some people even see you as Boagrius. That's so what true. I'm saying is that the people at Whoa. the table sometimes will see you as as what you play if they don't hang out with you outside of that. That's so, true. So so keep that in mind. Like with, with our D and D group. There are two other people in the in the party that I never see other than D and D, but to me, they are their characters. They are, well, they are who they that. represent at the table. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that's the only face that we kind of see. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's so it's very important to keep that in mind when you're building your character. Um, but that's it, not to say I want to build a murder hobo. That's what everybody's going to see me at. Like, no, no, no. But it is it is like if I'm going to be extra aggressive, um, it's then, a little peek behind the curtain. Of yeah, your psyche. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what process do you guys do when create cuz all three of us right now are creating characters for another friend's, I'm sorry, another acquaintance. Oh. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, campaign. Damn. <laughs> well, no, yeah, another friend's another friend is creating a campaign and uh, we are creating characters for that campaign. What process do you guys do? I think it's the third time I've asked. <laughs> <laughs> try again. Try yeah, again. one more just for the people in the back. We didn't hear you. Um for me, it's kind of different for depending on the character. For example, I've a lot of my characters have been based on like a feat in the book that I really mm -hmm. like. For example, there's a one called Mage Slayer, which is like makes you super good at killing magicians or whatever. And I really liked that idea, so I just it kind of gave me inspiration to kind of build that out. Is that why David Blaine isn't so prevalent anymore? That's right. I killed him. I slayed him. Um, but yeah, I just kind of took the just the basic words of the Mage Slayer feat, and I said, how can I, quote unquote, make this optimized or make it something that I like? And of course, I played a barbarian, because yeah. why not? And uh, this, this is the character that I had talked about before that he took Arcana proficiency and he was the sage background because mm -hmm. I wanted him to be learned in magical arts so that he could better kill mages or whatever mm -hmm. so the so the process that you created that character is through the book basically you looked at the stats you looked at the different um features that the character or the class would give you and and you built stories around that yep have you guys um done the opposite ever like created a backstory first and then decided to go into the book and say well how yep. can this yeah yeah with the first character i ever created it was all backstory i knew nothing of the book I knew nothing about feats, classes, races, so I created a character, and in my head, as I was writing the story, the background, a tiefling popped up, and so I went with that feat, and currently, I'm actually not even sure what race would best fit this character, because back in the day, I'm like, oh, ranger, I'll go with that, just because I didn't know what it was, but based on her backstory, even nowadays, having played various different uh, classes i'm not really sure what fits that backstory and i feel like that's something that if you don't know about the book you could really find yourself in a pickle so to speak you have to make uh 
make sacrifices in the vision of your character because there might not be something that fits that character right. perfectly. Or maybe it just involves multi-classing, and obviously you can't multi-class at level one, so it's like you're creating half a character. Yeah, you don't turn on until X level because that's when your multi-class is all set right. up and stuff. It, having to turn on takes a lot of foreplay in that aspect. Yeah. <laughs> so would you guys say, so then in your situation, uh, Sound Alchemist, uh, using the create a background first and then pick the class and race might uh, not be the best option. And that, yeah. Whereas with you, the the restriction is that you have to build or the backstory almost takes a uh, a backseat to the class and and the stats. It's for in my experience, it's more like you have to form your backstory to the world or the mechanics of D and D. So mm-hmm. in that way, it can be restrictive. But I'm pretty used to doing that, so it's not like it's not too much of a restriction because mm-hmm. I know that we're going to play D and D, so I want it to be uh, viable in a D and D setting. Yeah, interesting. What about you, Gershwin? Uh, w- well, when it comes to me, I, I do pick the. I, w- I would say I pick the class and the race first, and then kind of mold the story. But in this situation, the character that I'm building right now, I created the character with an initial thought, and then I spoke to the DM, and the DM seemed to be going in a different direction than what I wanted to create, so then I changed it up. So I, I would say that I have learned now from, from playing previous characters that there's another element to this, and that element is the DM. Right, the friend. I mean, the acquaintance. <laughs> the acquaintance. <yeah. laughs> it, it is important to kind of make sure your character fits right in the setting that your dm is trying to run a game around because you can't be a space hunter when your session your dm story still has no space to it yeah yeah or or even as simple as i'm a christian templar in this dnd world where the gods are not right there's the right no christianity yeah. so you gotta kind of speak to your dm ask about things in the world so that you have inf- all the information that you need to mm-hmm. kind of create your character so that it fits in the world that you're going to be playing in it. Otherwise, it's going to feel weird and you're kind of, it's kind of like you're gonna round peg, out. square hole. Like yeah. You don't really fit in the world. You don't really fit in the party. It's just going to be kind of weird and you're probably going to end up having to make another character. Yeah, and, and I think the, the big struggle with new players uh, for, or at or new players to D&D is that they have a character in mind, and usually that character comes from a different universe, mm-hmm. aka the the Link, the Wolverine, uh, and it really it it boils down as a DM. If you know that you you have a player coming to your party that is that type of character, you either have to have, you have to have a sit down conversation with them, be like, hey, that's not how I'm gonna run, or hey, yeah, let's try it. And the Sound Alchemist definitely said, yeah, let's try it out. I think that's a valuable thing to do for new players is kind of if they're making your first character, think of a character in pop culture, popular media that you like, that you think is a badass. Bridget B. That's right. And make a character <laughs> uh, trying to trying to make that in D&D, I guess. But the important thing for the DM is to either know that your character is going to be playing Link or try to fit Link, quote unquote, into your world. So That's it's not, not who I said. Not just straight Link or Bridget B. You know, I mean, and, and then also it boils, or it could be helpful to the DM if you do create a character with a rich backstory. Uh, so we all know, we all know and understand the performance of Bridget B. So as 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 a DM, you should create scenarios in which that Bridget B can can, can perform. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Probably a bard, right? Yeah, yeah, or, of course. Yeah, An entertainer background, basically, just really, yeah. mm-hmm. or yeah. a charlatan. A charlatan Ooh. would be really good. Yeah. Um, what are the what buffs though for a charlatan? You got um, like deception. I feel like that almost never comes to play though. Like no matter your what your background is, like for example, if you pick a sage, does that really gonna influence anything in the story? Yes, but not to the extent that a class or a race would, because of the fact that like. There's been a number of times where I've I've been in a, in a session, uh, and I and I've thought to myself, damn, if only I would have picked a different class to give me other languages to learn, mm-hmm. then I wouldn't have to worry about these 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 players running 
a, a secret campaign that we don't know about all because they read something that the DM said was in a language that I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, I would say that there's there's very uh, specific situations where that kicks in. Yeah. Uh, but I, it is important. Yeah, like you said, they're very niche. Like they don't come up nearly as often because the background. It's like what mm-hmm. you used to yeah. be or whatever. But what you used to be always pertains to who you are now. And I think the best example was when I was playing Alar. He was a sailor. He yeah. had a sailor background. Yeah. So he really helped in this campaign where we could get on the boat pretty easy. Yep. Yeah, I feel like depending on, like some are more prevalent than others. Right, Like definitely. the sailor background. Like we could have been on in a campaign that never saw the coast ever. Mm-hmm. And then that background wouldn't really have ever come up. Right. But it just, that's another reason to talk to your DM or, and be like, what kind of campaign are we going to be running or what's the main the broad thing so you can pick the background that might come up more often if you're going to be in a city maybe pick urchin or something like that so you have buffs that will help you in a city campaign yeah which is probably what happened um in your scenario because i remember that for that specific campaign where you played the sailor uh one of the initial things that um that that dm told me when i was creating my character is like oh yeah we're going to be on the sea there's going to be pirates uh, so, so yeah, it's all about talking to your DM, understanding mm-hmm. and asking as many questions as you can to the DM um, in order to pick that class, race, and background. Yeah, that's what makes session zero so important. Absolutely. Because you could spend all day making your background, making this badass character, and the DM's like, that's not going to work. If, yeah. you, if you create your character completely in a vacuum, then it's you shouldn't be surprised if problems come up when you mm-hmm. pitch that to the DM. Uh, yeah, and if your DM doesn't have a session zero, uh, try to do everything you can to have that session zero, just you and him. Or suggest it. Just say, hey, DM, we should have a sh- session zero. And if they're like, no, then you know, maybe get a hold of the other players and do it anyways without the DM or one-on-one yeah. with the DM. Or mm-hmm. you know. yeah. or start your own uh, session and just don't invite the DM yeah. and revolt. Revolt. Um. What other things did you guys do? What, what inspiration, uh, how do you guys get inspired to create the backstory to your your characters? Because in this situation, initially I wanted to play a druid. And the first thing I did is I checked out the Hobbit series again. Um, and I, I wa- rewatched the, the, what is it, oh, Radagast, Radagast the, the Brown? Brown. Yeah. He, he inspired me to play a druid as well. Just yeah. so druidy. Yeah. And pop, it, pop culture is just like... Yep bubbling with inspiration for D&D, especially now that D&D is becoming more mainstream and more people are playing it and mm-hmm. streaming it online. There's so, so much more inspiration out there. Yeah, it's like I never heard anybody talk about D&D. Now there's like four right. groups at my work that play it. And it's like, yeah, how did this come up? Like a year ago, I couldn't play D&D because I didn't know enough people that played it. No, we And have. now there's too many people. Yeah, I can't like, play with everybody. I'm turning down people because I can't. I don't have enough time to sleep. I already played... <laughs> Two, two times a week, and it's yeah. like more people want to play. Yeah. Did yeah. you used to play like four times a week at one point? I think it was three. Yeah. Either way, it was too much. Oh, the, the fourth one was your wife. That's yeah, a, yeah. That's something. <laughs> different, different kind of role play. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, so going on social media. I was always and, the, and dragon. Collecting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the dragon. The uh-huh. dragon? Whoa. She was the big D or the little D. Mm-hmm. Uh, Reddit is an excellent uh, place for you guys to get inspiration. There's mm-hmm. there's a huge community of people that um, not only uh, have, have created characters, but know what works and knows uh, how to power game sometimes or yeah. do it in a positive way. Yeah. Read fantasy books. Yep. Those are just D&D campaigns, but, you mm-hmm. know, there's so much. I've gotten so much inspiration from just listening to books or reading books. So when you're basing a character off of, like you said, pop culture, books, that kind of thing, do you find it more intriguing to figure out different combinations and stuff like that to get that character out and like on the field? I mean, if that's what you, if that's, if you find that fun is like, how do I fit, make Batman, but a D and D version of Batman, I kind of did that with like a monk rogue combo. But if you want to do that and it's fun, then make all your characters that way. It's not, I mean whatever makes you happy right. but i guess it's all preference but i wouldn't just say hey i'm batman like i'm bruce wayne what's up yeah yeah how do you the, feel the about oldie bruce home wayne? brewing these characters or does it have to be like if you're creating a character it has to be in the player's handbook and it's got to be this that like if you want to 
grappling hook for Batman. I won't let you create that weapon. I think you you would be the perfect person to um, answer this just because you've created your own spe- uh, magical weapons and you you have seen how certain magical weapons backfire so easily. Uh, I think when creating or homebrewing your own characters and not basing it off of a specific uh, character or class, uh, there's a risk, isn't there, of like just making a character that's a little OP or, or not. When you say homebrewing, do you mean like making your own race and class or what? I think that's what you right. mean. Yeah. 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 As a DM, I would be very hesitant to let a player do that just for balance reasons. Mm-hmm. I'd have to kind of research that. But I mean, if I looked it over and saw that it wasn't like the class wasn't super overpowered, or the race was wasn't overpowered then i'd have it's no like, problem with yeah it. You're, you're trying to make bridget b but with your home rules it's more like a mia khalifa and she's not yeah. doing that anymore yeah she only performed like once or twice and yeah it's she's, not the same performance no not at no. all um what you what what we do though in 40k for for example you created your own fan chapter and um yeah the, when you play your primark you play Gilliam and Statline. Right. So that's something that you should keep in mind. When you're creating, if you do want to create a, a, a race special to your world, use the stat line of an already existing uh, race. Right. Uh, that might be a way to, to go around it. So like, let's say you're making like a special type of drow that live under the sea. Still use the drow um, stats and everything, but maybe incorporate some... Triton. Like Triton yeah, abilities. Or just play a Triton, but you look like reskin it completely. Mm-hmm. Just like you look like a drow, but it's a water drow or whatever. Yep. Reskinning is probably your best friend if you if your DM doesn't want you to if your DM's mean like me and doesn't want you to homebrew stuff, reskinning is gonna be your best friend. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um now when I was creating my backstory, one thing that I did keep in mind because with this because this is a fan fantasy setting um, I um, and I've been watching Star Wars a lot. Um, I did go back to that whole hero's journey type of thing, where like the initial part is supposed to be a um, uh, an out of the ordinary birth or a creation that's out of like you know you're, you're Hercules, so you're born from the gods or you're, you're Anakin, Anakin. You have no doubt. Well, you were created by the Darth Plagueis. Yep. Yeah. Um, so m- when you're creating a character in D and D, understand that you're essentially creating a hero. Um, so you need to have a good beginning, but at the same time, don't make him OP in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't finish the hero's journey before you even cre- start the journey. <laughs> exactly. Story don't finish it in the background. Yeah. Like you shouldn't be a badass who slay dragons. At level one, before you even show up to any campaign, because mm-hmm. yeah. like we've said in other D and D podcasts, if you're such a badass at level one, why is a menial goblin killing you? Exactly, yes. yeah, or a wolf, mm-hmm. a wolf, a wolf. And with that in mind, that's how I want to play my new character for this new campaign that we're doing. I don't want the focus to be in my background. I want my character to progress from the start of the campaign. So almost like he's starting over a new life. That should be the goal, really. You, yeah. Your hero's journey should happen during the campaign mm-hmm. yep. and with everybody else. But usually the backstory is like the fuel to your fire. Yes, Why it's, are it's you the reason you decided to get right. off your ass and adventure because any sane person is not going to want to be an adventurer. It's True. very dangerous. Mm-hmm. But it's rewarding. That's the that's the trade-off. Yeah. Um, and also play around with various uh, characters and then pitch them to your DM and then... Maybe even have him choose because at the end of the day, if if your DM likes the character that you're creating, you're more than likely going to have positive oh, sessions yeah. because yes. of that. Uh, so creating multiple characters uh, would would be kind of fun. And don't have your ideas set in stone. Yeah, mm-hmm. be prepared to kind of be fluid with your ideas to make it fit, like we said, with the campaign. Right. And be a master manipulator. So if you create a uh, a certain backstory and your DM says no, try to reword it in a way that he would say yes. You yeah. mean yes? <laughs> yes. Jedi mind tricks, um, but but yeah, it is a a constant conversation that you have to have with your DM. Yeah, and I I had that conversation with the DM because the whole main focus of my character that I was creating was that he's disabled, he's paralyzed from the neck down, and he's like, well, that's gonna be a huge hindrance. You do realize this? I'm like, yeah, but like I wanted to play at a handicap to see how that felt, and he's like, well, maybe you just can't use your legs. Or maybe you have a broken arm. 
It's mm-hmm. like, no, like, that's... Go big or go home. Right, like, I need this to be the focal point. Not just for me, but to see how the reactions and how every other player um, kind of reacts to that handicap. And you ended up... So he didn't let you do that. He made you use a familiar. Oh, that was also my idea, though. It, but but then when the the actual uh, session was running, what did you do? You got rid of your familiar, and you really were just a mm-hmm. body, right? Uh, but I think that was like that wasn't the DM. That was no, that was that me. was your by by his plan. But that that's what I'm trying to get at. Like even if you create a certain idea to a character, and your DM says no, when you're actually playing, there's ways to sneak around the DM <laughs> and and play what you wanted to play. Um, uh, and also take the advice of the, of the DM, though. Yeah, like yeah. he's not there to, you know, make you have a bad time. Yeah. Right. And I think you, I think we all learned um, from seeing that character that sometimes playing a character against the DM is not gonna is not gonna come out. Because the end of the day, well. the DM controls the whole world. world yeah. Right. So you versus the world is not gonna end in your favor. True. True. Uh, which brings us to alignment. Um, it's important to have a similar alignment to the party. Um, if you don't, sometimes you could just be um, exiled by the by the actual uh, oh, yeah. group, or at the very least, just always outvoted. Mm-hmm. Like if if you're a completely different alignment, like you're evil, everybody else is good, or the vice versa, and the whole rest of the party just says, mm, "We're not going to do what you want to do right. every time," just because your views are so widely different, it's not going to be fun for you. Right? Yeah. So like, I really want to play an evil guy who steals uh, at the sight of every tiefling. Obviously, the party's going to get a hold of this, and you're not going to be doing it all that much. Yeah, and then at the end, it just becomes a situation where it's like, well, I don't want to go to you know the regular D&D sessions because the party's assholes. <laughs> but really, it's just <laughs> like, you. no, you're trying to play against yeah, the yeah, party. You're just not fitting with the group. And that's important for a session zero, not only to speak to the DM, but to the other players and make sure that all of your... Um, characters fit together right in some way they don't have to be they don't all have to be lawful good they don't necessarily have to be uh lawful good and like all good like lawful good chaotic good neutral good you can differentiate a little bit but just know that your goals should line up in some way right because if you have conflicting viewpoints you're really going to slow down the pace of the story and everything really um, how much of uh, how ahead do you guys look at a certain class or race when you're creating a new character? Usually, no more than three, mm-hmm. level three, or at least to the point where you get to pick your subclass. Okay. For me, it depends on if I'm going to multi-class, because if I'm going to multi-class, we're starting at level three, let's say, or one, and I I multi-class at level ten. That's the pl- like that's when I want want to switch o- switch over. Then I'll tend to plan it out more. Mm. But most of the time, I think I just kind of wing it. I, don't, I, I look at the, like you said, level three, because that's usually when your character becomes what it's meant to be. Right. And then after that, most of the time, it's kind of like, ever, oh, I get that at this yeah. level. That's cool. So with that in mind, have you ever just picked a character that, like, let's say I want to be a fighter, and based on what happens during your sessions and your campaign and story, that dictates what type of fighter you are? Like maybe we're fighting all giants, so now you're gonna be like, uh, I forgot what it's called. But it's like you you do extra damage against like giant opponents or whatever. For yeah, um, that I really want to play a campaign like that, but it's hard to get everybody on board for that kind of thing. Yeah, you, you kind of like during the session zero, you kind of have to be like, this is how we we want to progress our characters. We make decisions based off of what happens in the mm-hmm. during those sessions, not necessarily our preset plan. Yeah. Yeah, because if you want to like multi class into like the monk, then you have to like go to a temple, do so many like martial arts sessions with yeah. them or whatever, and then that's how you become, yeah, you know, multi classed into that. Or like you said, if you're a ranger, and I think actually I think at level one, so that's not a good. But you you want to get a special a certain uh, favorite enemy, mm-hmm. you actually have to do research on that enemy so that you know these things, you know right. this language that you get. So it's not kind of out of the blue. And you work that out in the campaign. Because mm-hmm. it doesn't make sense how it's like, oh, yeah, we've been fighting together for, you know, 20 sessions. We're really established warriors. And then the next day, oh, I can do magic, by the way. 
Yes. Because it's like, how? Like, nothing changed, and now you're able to, like, shoot fireballs. Early on in my D&D career, I got a proficiency in making rope. And I was like, okay, I got to go find a guy and teach me how to make rope. And my DM was like, that's cool, but you don't necessarily have to do all that. It's, I mean, it's, you can do it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But for the tinier things like that, it's kind of, you can role play it out as much as you want. Yeah. Uh, how much of uh how much of, what what are the key things to ask a dm when you're creating um a, a character uh, so in my situation i the number one thing i asked the uh dm is like well where would i have lived and what were the, what are the people like what is the the scenario that i'm in uh, but what about you guys what um what are some key things that you need to know about the world before you start i think the where and the when is really important because if you're going to be taking place underwater, obviously you want somebody that can breathe underwater or something like that. And also the time, like are there metal weapons? Is it like, are you in a city? Is it, is this a futuristic kind of thing to kind of help you cement yourself in this world? Did you have anything to ask out of creature when you were asking? I think you should ask, well, kind of what you're saying. I would pitch my character to the DM and then say, where does my character fit in your world? Like, is there a place where this type of backstory can be easily slotted in? Or is mm -hmm. it something that we have to create to make a place? Like, for example, oh, I have a, I come from a fishing city. Their main export or whatever is fish. So, in, like, is there a city that, that you have in your world that's like that? Nope. And if no not, fishing city that's made export of fish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. That's all a deer. If the answer medicine. is no, then it's like maybe we should create one together. Or mm. or if the DM says, oh, sorry, you're landlocked. There's no rivers, no oceans. That doesn't really make any sense. And say, okay, then how can I change it to make it make sense in your world? Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's basically ask questions that are going to make your character fit. What, like you said, what's the, what's the time period? Uh, where are you? Where are we at? Even though it can change a lot during the campaign, right, the longer like, your campaign goes, the more different places yeah, you're going to go. Because let's say you're playing like a centaur, and there's no centaurs here. Yes. So how? Where did you come from? Yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like what? You, just let them know what your race, what your class is, if it makes sense, uh, stuff like that. What happens if they say, oh, I love everything except the race? Is that like a game breaker for you? Like, let's say the DM says, everything's perfect but one thing. Would that cause you to start from scratch? It could. It just depends on what that, how integral that one thing is. What would it have to be in your case for it to be, nope, I'm scrapping it. I got to start from scratch. Because the race thing is kind of important. Because that's, that's how you line. see yourself. Yeah. Well, not only that, but that's your stat line. That's where you're going to get your pluses, right? Yeah, like charisma, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. like he says oh sorry you can't play a human and you were banking it on being a human the whole time of feet. Yeah. or even like no you can't play or a croco it's like oh but i really wanted to fly yes yeah, like, no flying's gonna be too powerful in this campaign yeah what's well, like you can't work around that well yeah i think if if like for me i think it would be if i am fixed on a key feature of that race or even that class and they say no you can't play it then i think that might be a deal breaker well i feel like that's the dm's job even before you get started to say, before you guys make your characters, this is off limits. These races don't exist, classes or whatever you want to prohibit, make sure the characters know that before they start making their characters because if they have this really awesome character idea for a centaur and they can be like, oh, there's not really that many centaurs. It's like, all right, I wasted all that time. I'm really hooked on this character. Already bought the model. And then maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe you ask, like, is there any way we can make this work? And if they're absolutely set up against it, then... Now, you could be a centaur, but the top half. <laughs> top half horse? Yeah. That's a minotaur. That's It'll a be bull. bull. That is true. Um, so, another thing that I learned through multiple uh, plays through characters is that sometimes your backstory is not going to come into like the At main all. Yeah, yeah, the main spotlight. And, and don't be butthurt about it. Um, invest in the story that the DM is playing right. or running. The thing with backstories is I feel like that's a way to connect with the rest of the party. Like you're at a campfire, you're telling stories, and then that's a good time to say, oh, by the way, I was raised with elves. And it's like, oh, elves, really? What tribe? And then that kind of brings the whole party t together. And you bring up a good point is if you feel like the DM is not integrating your backstory enough 
then bring it up yourself. Try to force it into the story. Let the characters know around the campfire about your backstory. Bring it up in such a way as like, and so if the other players get interested, then and the players are like, oh, let's go, go to your hometown because I want to see. You talked about this really cool building or whatever. This really the huge biggest library in the world. I want to check it out. So we're gonna go there, and the DM might be like, oh, I didn't didn't think this would happen, but yeah. then then you're kind of like for, forcing the party the to go into your backstory or mm-hmm. whatever you wanna. And the highlight. Key- and the key part about that is, I think the Sound Alchemist is really good at this, making it a moral thing. Um, because you, there's been many situations where your character has has done a speech in front of the whole party, and then all of a sudden, the sentiment of your character changes. It's like, oh, now I feel bad for poor little um, Alar or what was the other guy? Miguelito. Miguelito, sorry. <laughs> and... Um, then so when you're creating your backstory add a moral twist to it right. uh, which isn't that hard like just Call have your parents story. die yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's classic that, yeah, that's why that's tragic why backstory is tragic like, most adventurers yeah. are orphans so yeah but make sure to throw that out there um and, and make it um make it believable make it like uh like something that would make somebody tear up um, because we've also had players in, in, in the group that have a backstory that is sad, but they don't introduce it as sad. And it's just kind of, it is what you just said. Well, everybody's an orphan. So just, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, screw, who, who cares? You know? Right. But this foot belonged to my brother. Then you're Frankenstein <laughs> yeah. and that's interesting. Yeah. 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 interesting. And then now we want to go to, where's Franz, Frankenstein's from? Transylvania? No, that's, that's the vampire, right? <laughs> <laughs> something like that they're all yeah. in the same area they all talk like this <laughs> but yeah I feel like the backstory really could be a driving force but it, it all depends on how you present it it also yes. depends on how you your DM uses backstories I guess yeah like I, I love writing backstories for my characters it's m- more for me I guess than the, the DM mm-hmm. but when I send them the DM and they don't they only read half of it <laughs> then I kind of wasted my it's time it's like don't send them a book it. either because you kind of expect them not to read it if you send yes. them a whole yeah. You should kind of, and you can even ask your DM, like, how long do you want my backstory to be? Do you want a backstory at all? And if you, if they say, like, eh, don't do something very long, then don't. Like, they're not going to read it. They told you they're not going to read it. Mm-hmm. So don't mm-hmm. waste your time unless, like like me, it's for more for you than the DM. How helpful has the uh, player's guide been in creating the backstory? Because then they, that offers you a, what is it, ideals, flaws, goals, well, short-term goal, long-term goal, and then there's some other stuff, right? Well, in the, in the personality the, traits the, in the player's handbook, you get personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaws. Yeah, that's all. That's, they have like charts for you to pick off of. So, have you ever uh, actually sat down and used that to? to create I didn't the even backstory? know that was a thing. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> interesting. I, I that's usually the last thing I do for my character because okay. I do everything else, make the whole character, and then like. Even I, I pick and choose from different charts, not even necessarily for the background yeah. that I have, or I make yeah. them up myself mm-hmm. because they, they don't really come into play all that much. I feel like if it's more char- for you, yeah, like, like if, if you, for you can't find a bond for your character, how do you expect to like actually be that invested into it? Yeah, the way that I use it is because so this is the very first this the latest character is the very first time I use that chart, and um, what I found is that when I went to the bond section, I was able to create. Um, something that the DM can latch onto, and that was like my bond. My bond was supposed to be like a, a bond with my dwarven uh, brethren, and bond with like a special mount that I created. And I gave that to the DM, and the DM um, created a backstory behind that. Um, so it is beneficial to use if you for, are for just running for. Uh, oh, it's a new guy. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so if you. Um, if you are drawing a blank and you just have too many options, there's mm-hmm. too many sci-fi characters or fantasy characters that you can think of, going going into that um, that list of personality traits and flaws and all that kind of stuff, it, it, it's helpful. Oh yeah, it, it definitely seems helpful. I just I haven't used it that way, but it seems like a really good resource to do that kind of thing. Even reading like the little paragraphs that they have in each race can give you a lot of inspiration on how to build your character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then going back to the character. Uh, uh, not classes, but the other one. What is it? Background. Background. Yeah, because they give you the options, and sometimes when you can't decide, rolling a dice and just picking from the chart and building off of that yeah. is 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 fun. Yeah. It's entertaining, uh, and it's something that I, I we would have 
I would have done for a character that we created for our um, our D and D like uh, D DM switching the round table. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's something that you could even develop as the story goes along. It does your backstory doesn't necessarily have to be at session zero. You could jump into a a campaign and then like slowly build up your character based on the world and based on you know things that you come up with. Yeah, or even have the DM take care of that. Just be like, hey, I'm gonna be a barbarian. I don't know human. Why? And then that's gonna be up to the barbarian to like. As the session progresses, some guy comes up to you and be like, hey, you're the barbarian that survived that fire 10 years ago. Yep. And then you start to learn like, oh, okay. Yep. That's all. I like that idea. It's a lot to put on the DM, a lot extra to put on the DM. So unless you really had trust in your DM, I would just just make sure you trust your DM to, to do that if you're going to go that route. Yeah. Because that's a lot of extra on top of all the stuff they already have to do, just mm-hmm. think of your backstory kind of thing. And it's like, what if you don't like it? Then you're like, oh, dang, now yeah. I'm always going to like... If you're going to put it in the DM's hand, you really can't be picky about yeah. it once they come up with something. But the cool thing about that is that the DM then becomes invested in your character and you won't die because well, he's, he's the DM's character yeah. um, unless yeah. he wants to use you as a plot thing. And that actually happened with me. Like the, I got a background for a druid and that druid's parents mysteriously either died or got taken away or they're they're gone so it's up to me to figure out what happened to them that's a cool thing to put into your backstories is mystery or open questions that the dm can fit in mm-hmm. yeah and something that you should do when you're making your backstory is put hooks in it that your dm can use lots of interesting things that mm-hmm. will inspire your dm to be like oh i can fit this in with this person's backstory leave it open ended in certain spots mm-hmm. So that your DM can play with it. Yeah. Um, Open it up. It's playtime. Now something that I remembered about, uh, or that I, I thought about when you uh, did a, a voice. Uh, role playing your character and building like a voice and like a, a whole personality to the character is something awesome to do before you even get to, uh, you know, session one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and something that... I, because uh, I really wanted to do a Scottish dwarf, the stereotypical. Uh, so I've been watching like a lot of videos and watching like movies with Scottish accents to to to, to get that uh, or to get into the the role. Um, so that's something also to keep in mind. Uh, really like bring the character to life at the table. Mm-hmm. Um, but in order to do that, you kind of have to build the character uh, yeah. personality wise. Think about it more than what's on the page. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you could have the strongest character, the most OP badass ever, but... If What's it, his favorite color? Yeah. Oh, what did you eat last night? Yeah. What's your favorite meal? It's give, like, give your character quirks that aren't mm-hmm. on the character sheet. Right. He stutters. That's yeah. something that Gersh One has done. Maybe. Stuttering is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. If he wants to hear hear your fears, so he asks everybody that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's something that you, you kind of have to... Um, really have to think about that beforehand you can't just oh and and also remind yourself after or before every session i played a paladin and i didn't act very paladin after like the third session uh and that was because i didn't remind myself to get into that character uh so there are sometimes sometimes you have an idea for an awesome character like let's say it is link and you want to be the good guy in the story and then uh, two months in, you realize, hey, I, I, I kind of like the Joker now. I want to play the same character as a Joker now. It's not, it's, it's not going to really work. So you have mm-hmm. to talk to the DM, and and if you got to commit, kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because that is, a, I've seen that's a struggle with more than just me at the tabletop. Sometimes one session a character would act a certain act a certain way, and then all of a sudden they're running away and they don't want to fight. Uh, when you know last session they were trying to rile everybody up and rally the troops to fight yeah that's true so it is something that you have to commit to like you said um how do you feel about not knowing the backstory for other characters not just your own like the rest of the party members it's awesome for the initial uh bits after a while it it does get annoying and i because we, let it out. Let it we, out. We know of a situation like this, right? We have a player in the group that keeps everything a secret. It seems like um, she has whole sessions all by herself. And then all of a sudden you find out like, oh, she can do this. 
And it's like, yeah, I, me and the DM worked it out. And it's it's one of those situations where it it bothers me because of the um, the whole point of when you're at the table, you're also watching. You're watching a story unfold. And how am I supposed to invest on your character that you created if I don't even know like the backstory or what's actually even happening? So that is something to keep in mind. If you do have a backstory and you want to keep it secret, the secret should be revealed at some point to the party. But, I mean, uh, the, when you said that, since I've also been watching Star Wars a lot, yeah. Luke lost his lightsaber at the end of, what was it? M Empire. Yeah, and then he gets another one, like, without even explaining how. Mm -hmm. Different color and everything. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's just you're left wondering what happened. And I think that's, there's two ways you can take it. Oh, that's so cool. It's up to my imagination as to what he did and what he had to go through to accomplish it. And then it's like, oh, well, I really want to know what's official. Yeah, like, how just, he did that. Yeah, yeah. I just don't want to like be left in the dark all the time. Yeah. And again, it, it it's tough because if somebody wants to come to the table and play that way, there's nothing that you can do to, to stop them. Just like mm. if somebody wants to show up and be a murder hobo, there's nothing that you can do to stop them. They, they're they going to they're gonna fight whoever they're going to fight. Um, but just keep it in mind that like, it would be good etiquette to just let people in on your backstory. I feel like secrets are super fun to have in backstories, but I don't think they should be the whole backstory. Mm -hmm. You should, it, And if your whole backstory is a secret, then come up with another one that you can tell the players that's bullshit. Yeah. So they have something. Yeah. yeah. And also for the secret stuff that you do one-on-one -on -one with a player, like you said, oh, I have secret stuff. I'll come over here. I'll talk to you. We'll do it secretly. Think about this is a, more as a DM, I guess, as the player too that has the secret stuff. Is this gonna matter if everybody else sees it? Yeah, yeah. Like, is there a good reason that I'm keeping this a secret from the party, or is it kind of just to have secret stuff happen? Yep. Do you think that increases the relationship between the people who know the secret, well, guess, or is it more it of a depends detriment? What the secret is, I think. Yeah, I like, guess. for example, but the person who doesn't know the secret, well, it doesn't matter what the secret is because they don't know it, no matter what. But if the secret is like, I hate that guy. Then there's a good reason to keep it a secret. Not for the other guy, because he could be thinking 120 million other things. But if he knows that you hate him, then that's instant conflict between the characters. But he's already has conflict because he doesn't know that you hate him. Sure. I... Well, because in in because we ran through something like this in one of our campaigns, and it ended up costing me a character. Um, the the oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. like the whole the whole thing was that there was secrets being passed around between two people in the party and um i wanted to get in on the secret so i created uh, uh, a secret of my own that i told one other uh character and then all of a sudden uh there was there was a secret that i was telling one character that well, that character was telling another character and there was one person that was out of the loop and and to put it into perspective they were real secrets like we went out of the room to actually discuss this away from that one character and that that can be fun but it can also be really annoying because then you're just like why are you sitting there you're sitting at a table while people are whispering in another room like you don't want to do that and i ended up dying and the secret was that i was i wanted to become a werewolf right and i ended up becoming a werewolf and I, I was the one who didn't know he wanted to be a werewolf. So I yeah. ended up killing him for yeah. becoming a werewolf. Yeah. So mm. then it, it became one of those scenarios where it's like. But I feel like that's not necessarily the secret's fault. I feel like that's just character. If I would have known he wanted to be a werewolf, I probably wouldn't have killed him. Exactly. Or no, but so it, if if you knew, but your character didn't know. That's harder. But what I think it is, is that. It's difficult to to have actual secrets at the tabletop uh, that pertain to your backstory um, and then not actually share them with the part or with the people sitting at the table. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Yeah. But also, you said as long as they come out at some point. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. if you have secrets, they should come out at some point, and I agree. But also, there's going to be time when you don't know, and that's going to be frustrating. If the secret should come out or not? No, no, no. There's going to... If you... I have a secret. You guys will find out eventually in the story-wise. Yeah. But all the time in between that, mm -hmm. you're going to feel frustrated because you don't know the secret. If we know that there is a secret, yeah. What so I mean, you, if I'm taking uh, you out of the room and whispering to you, 
you're gonna know there's a secret oh yeah 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 for but again the thing that you do that's different than what has been done is that usually that secret gets revealed right away and i think it goes back to the whole idea that you said if you know that this is this secret should even be a secret and shouldn't be shared at the table then i'm gonna set it to tell the dm in a side room but if the secret doesn't have to be like th- there's no need to go mm-hmm. and be all secretive you can role play it then you role play it yeah and i think that's the difference because there was a time when her i think we were the only ones left at the table for some reason everybody else had to go home or whatever yeah, yeah. And there was secret, secret stuff just happening to me and it involved your character yeah but you were still there yep. and i think it made that scene so much better because you were there yeah and i got to watch yeah yeah so definitely like even if it's a secret against that player you can trust you have to trust the player that to keep it out of the game yeah or out of their character's mm-hmm. mind or whatever but if if a, if a player breaks that trust then you know which again goes back to uh, etiquette on the, at the tabletop. Yeah. If your character knows, or if you know a, uh, a secret that your character is not supposed to know, act that way. Role play it. Yeah. Um, but uh, but again, secrets can be really fun. Yeah, they can. Like, I played in a game where I, like I said last episode, I basically played Batman. I was like a monk, rogue, multi class. Was this episode? Oh, <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> um. I was basically our DM would give us downtime between missions and he want us to write up what we did during the downtime and I'd write something up and then I'd write up something else up. Oh, I did this vigilante stuff on the side and it was cool because my DM would say when we got back together as a party, you're like, yeah, there's this rumors of some masked dude going around. That's badass. Um, yeah. Saving people or whatever. And everybody in the party's like, well, that's interesting. Like, but they didn't really want to explore it because it wasn't that big. And then that character ended up dying and then that's when they found out that it was me and it was like a huge thing. And it, it felt awesome because none of them had any idea that it was me. And then when I died, they figured it out. And it's like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And I think the key to that is that it didn't affect anybody in the party. Yes. Other than just like, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, whereas like, so to keep that in mind, if you do want to keep something a secret, uh, if it is about a certain person. You know. Or it affects them in some way. Yeah, then mm-hmm. somehow let them know. Because so it is it's fun to watch. Right. So do you think no letting others know what your character that you're creating is at the beginning, do you think that takes away the fun out of it? Yes. Like let's say if we make a brand new session mm-hmm. where nobody tells anybody what race, what class they are, do you think that would be just as enjoyable as saying before even you even start playing, Oh, by the way, I'm a human rogue. I think that'd be really cool. Just because I, I'm I lean more to the I like secrets. Mm-hmm. So I think that would be awesome if we all came in with secrets and like we were slowly finding out everybody's stuff as the campaign progresses. I think that would be really cool. Yeah, and and that has happened um, where somebody's like a hooded individual and you don't really know yeah. what that person is. But then at the same time, it, um, it is just something that your character could just go up. Hey, man, why are you wearing a hood? You pull it down, and then <laughs> he can say no, and then you go why, and then that creates like role playing. Right. Uh, that's fun. That's fun, yeah. So that you feel like putting all your cards out there isn't always the best move. Like it, saying, it, like depends on the character, yeah. yeah. But if everybody knows what's out there, wouldn't that kind of unify the group of saying, "Oh, well, your backstory seems really interesting. Let's go explore that first. There's that other positive too. I think that it should come out organically, regardless. Um, if I'm just meeting your character, if my character just meeting your character for the first time. There's no reason for me to tell you my life story like it should come as we grow a friendship or a bond Mm -hmm. then we'll start uh sharing things about ourselves with each other because that's only natural for things that happen as you grow close to somebody which kind of sucks so like let's say you're really excited to tell somebody that oh i'm actually bridget b but i'm a clone of bridget a and i'm trying to kill that clone to be the original bridget b there can only be one yeah and if that gets revealed then that's all. but it's like what if you have to wait like six months for you to say it and at that point what if you what if you die before your whole backstory is revealed well well, trust me like if you are playing bridget b we're gonna be able to (laughs) figure it out like right right away away. Mm -hmm. the performance outshines everything else uh yeah um but i mean dying before everything gets revealed it's a bummer it happens like it's it's a game and you can die it sucks but i mean if if none of it was revealed, just bring into the next character. That's true. So you yeah. should always have a backup, is what you're saying. No, I actually don't think that at all. I think you should not make backup characters 
because if you like that backup character better than the character you're playing now, then you're just going to find excuses to get rid of the character you're playing now, and there's going to be yeah. a cycle of new characters. Which is kind of what's happening with us now. Yes. We're almost at the end of a campaign that's been like over a year, and he, the DM just said, oh, by the way, there might be a new campaign around the corner. Make characters. Yeah, and that's I'm definitely struggling with that because mm-hmm. this new character I really like, I really want to play, but I'm also really invested in the character that I've been playing for over a year. It's... It's hard. Mm-hmm. That's why I don't think you should ever make backup characters. How do you bal- balance that with other uh, DMs? So, like, let's say you, because you do have multiple sessions, um, how do you balance, like, the different uh, characters? Yeah, it's like, I like character A from session Tuesday is better than character B from session Thursdays. Like, yeah. I just think that's going to happen. Like, as you make characters that you, like, you don't have any experience with, like for example, I played a bard in our little roundtable DM. I only played it for like two sessions, but it didn't like bard didn't really scream to me. I didn't love the character as much as a different character. It just depends on your play style. But you also can't play this. I mean, you can, but it's you playing the same character in, in every campaign. campaign yeah. yeah, it seems like it would get redundant and boring. Mm-hmm. That's just me. We said a lot to uh, to help you create your own character. Hopefully. No. Um, if you guys have any questions uh, regarding uh, specifics about creating a character or classes or races or anything, please comment down in the comment section below. We're asking you guys so that we can create uh, these podcasts specifically tailored to you. Um, so if you do have any suggestions, comment down below. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed. Yeah, hopefully you can take the two main things that I think we talked about the most is make sure you talk to your DM before finalizing a character. And uh, background plays a pretty big, important role. Yeah. And probably the third most important part, or I would say, like, the most important part, check out Bridget B. Um, but <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, this has mm-hmm. been Gershwan. Docile Creature. And the Sound Alchemist. Signing out. <laughs>